very much, John, and um, thank you, Brenda, uh, and your committee for that lovely gift. Uh, when you talked about the different color stones, it's, it's quite appropriate because, of course, I do live in Situate for part of the year, uh, and my uh, grandfather came from County Cork uh, and was a survivor of the 1847 uh, Famine, 1846, uh, 47, came here uh, as a as an orphan to New York City, uh, where he uh, had considerable success. So uh, the, the story of the famine is is quite close to me, uh, and even on my uh, even on my uh, mother's side, uh, we have roots to another uh, terrible tragedy in the north. Uh, in, in, in Ireland, and that was, of course, the mini famine of 1879-1882 that both my uh, mother's uh, parents experienced before they came here to the United States. So the whole topic is, is quite close to me, so I, I really do appreciate uh, uh, that, that, that gift, a uh, very uh, unusual and creative one. So uh, on to the topic of, of today's uh, Talk. Can you can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, October seventh uh, uh, next week will uh, mark the hundred and seventieth anniversary of the wreck of the brig St. John, just a mile off the coast of Cohasset, uh, during a very fierce uh, autumn nor'easter. Uh, the loss of ninety-nine Galway and Clare passengers and seven crew members who in ordinary weather would have reached uh, Boston uh, later that day is surely one of the most poignant of the 50 famine ship tragedies that have been document documented by the historian Edward Laxton. The beautiful Celtic Cross in uh, Cohasset Central Cemetery was dedicated in 1914 in memory of the people who lost their lives there. And it was an initiative that uh, was started by the ancient order of Hibernians. And I think this represents one of the very first of famine memorials to be constructed uh, here in North America. And certainly uh, it will be an important landmark on the proposed South Shore Irish Trail, uh, already ready-made for Brenda and her committee to move forward on that. Now, um, some of you may recall from my talk last spring uh, on the Great Famine that uh, Skibbereen in West Cork was more or less the epicenter of famine mortality uh, and exodus, and indeed press coverage in 1847. Two years later, in 1849, it was Clare and Galway that uh, was virtually the ground zero of the worst conditions. And once again, the Illustrated London News sent its reporters and its artists, particularly James Mayony, uh, to Clare uh, to do reporting and provide graphic images that would uh, show the hard conditions that propelled so many to risk their lives. Uh, on the long and dangerous uh, Atlantic crossing. And here you can see some of those illustrations that appeared in the Illustrated London News at that time. Uh, a couple of children uh, digging in the rubble, looking for uh, perhaps some potatoes or something to eat, uh, with a, another person in the background. Is, uh, I hope you can make that out okay. Uh, uh, and here we have a sketch that the uh, artists uh, from the London Illustrated News did showing an abandoned village in County Clare where uh, the residents probably would have been evicted uh, and put on the road uh, and hopefully some of them were able eventually to make their way to America. Uh, and here, this is one of the most iconic uh, illustrations of the time. Uh, and it shows the daughter of the local poor law inspector, Captain Kennedy, distributing clothes to uh, young children and starving people. And you can see, you can see in that sketch how thin the uh, people are, and they have no shoes or anything. Uh, and um, Captain Kennedy's daughter, uh, of course, would have witnessed some of these things. And even as a little girl. 
She showed great compassion and gave some of her own clothes and toys uh, for the neighboring children. Ironically, about a month later, uh, one child was found on the road dead, and that child had on the, some of the clothes that uh, Captain Kennedy's daughter had given uh, to her. Captain Kennedy himself eventually got so appalled by the insufficiency of the aid coming from the government that he resigned his position uh, as, a, as a civil servant. So uh, it was through sketches like these uh, and also this one uh, that people began to, to get their information from Ireland and uh, also, of course, some of it coming to America. This is another famous sketch of that time in December of 1849, a little bit after the Brig St. John people had departed County Clare. And what's interesting about this one is that this particular person is identified in previous catches that they weren't, except for the cap captain's daughter. And there was an interview of this woman that accompanied uh, the sketch. And it seems that she had uh, lost uh, her husband and uh, at least three other children, and also had, had a miscarriage uh, quite uh, uh, recently before this sketch was done, and she was being evicted. We don't know what happened to her, to her after that time. It's no wonder then that the um, Claire Examiner, uh, the Limerick and Clare Examiner of 10 January uh, 1849, had made a mistake there, it should be not 1949, 1849, uh, uh, said this about the prospect of immigration. But the Irish hail with joy the day they land on a foreign shore, leave this land of plagues and go where fortune honor and independence await them, where their remains will be interned in consecrated ground, surrounded by their families and friends, weeping and thanking the Lord that their corpses are not exposed to the ravages of dogs and swine." Uh, so uh, that's the, some of the... Uh, I'm going to give you some more background on, on uh, those times as, as we move forward. Uh, but first, let me give you some background on the ship and its owner. Now, according to Lloyd's register, uh, the Brig St. John was built in St. John's, New Brunswick, Canada by a Liverpool fir firm by the name of St. Owens and Company. The vessel's dimensions were approximately 200 tons and somewhere between 90 and 100 feet in length. And as a brig, its masts were square rigged. Initially, the ship was used to transport timber from Canada to Britain. The original ship owner sold the vessel for 1,500 pounds in 1848 to the prosperous Galway merchant, landowner, and magistrate, Henry Comerford. And here is, uh, here is a contemporary model that was just completed about oh, a month ago by a Galway resident, and that is going to be a centerpiece in an exhibit in Galway next, uh, well, this fall and, and next uh, June, when Galway is the uh, center of European culture. And I think I'm going over there to give a talk there, at least it seems to be in the works. Uh, so it, it shows that there is a consciousness of the story in Galway, which is important too. Uh, here is Henry Comerford, and as you can see by his dress, it's kind of a foggy picture there. He must have been quite prosperous to be dressed as he was. He was born in Milltown, County Clare, but came to Galway as a young man with his brother Isaac and his sister. And he enjoyed considerable success moving up from being a carpenter to being owner of two timber yards, a grain store, a large farm, a substantial house in Galway City, and eventually a substantial property at Ballykeel, County Clare, the latter as a result of a very smart marriage to uh, Margaret McDonough. <laughs> this is his house in Galway, which some of you, if you've been to Galway, may recognize as being just beside the, uh, the arch uh, down on the waterfront. 
And uh, this was his personal residence. Later became the, uh, oh, probably 70, 80 years ago, it became the Galway uh, uh, City, uh, uh, City Museum, and I think it still operates as, as, as that at, at, at present. And here is his uh, County Clare house that he got uh, through, his, through his marriage. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Cometh had had holdings in both North Clare and Connemara, amounting to 3,000 acres, uh, as well as Galway City real estate. He may have owned a number of ships prior to his purchase of the Brig St. John in uh, 1848, but I've only been able to document that uh, he owned three. Now, a considerable number of Brig St. John passengers came from the Inner Stein and Polar Union of North Clare and the Octorad Polar Union of County Galway, where Comerford had holdings. The region were characterized by tiny holdings where the impoverished tenants depended on potato for about 60% of their food source in ordinary times. Thus, the successive failure of the potato uh, crop uh, between 1845 and 1849 had catastrophic implications. Those on the coastal areas of Galway and North Clare who had supplemented their potatoes with fishing sold their equipment early on in order to purchase food in the winter of 1846, leaving them totally unable to purchase alternative food in the spring of 1847. In fact, during the summer of Black 47, County Clare had some of the highest numbers of people totally dependent upon government-organized soup kitchens that replaced the failed public work schemes uh, of uh, the previous year. When the revised Poor Law uh, of 1847 under the Gregory Clause prevented anyone holding more than a quarter of an acre from getting public relief either in or out of the workhouse and placed the full cost of relief on the landowners, it put the cottiers in a terrible, terrible position. What many of them did in order to get relief was simply give up their holdings to the landlord in order to get into the workhouse. Uh, uh, and the result of this was that uh, 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 if they didn't do this and if they were evicted, uh, they had no choice uh, other than to take to the roads and hopefully get, uh, uh, get across the Atlantic. But we do know that between 1848 and 1854, in Clare alone, 21,000 people were left homeless as, as a result of these policies. Um, and of course, disease was another factor that began to creep in in uh, gigantic uh, 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 proportions in 1847 and 48 on to 1851. The surviving reports of the Ennestime and Poor Law Guardians, uh, 1848 and 49, attest to the mounting deaths of workhouse residents even from sickness and disease as well as to the escalating costs of poor rates and famine relief. For instance, in the week ending July 21st, 1849, 10 weeks before the Brig St. John sailed, there were 2,500 inmates in the Ennestime and workhouses. 859 families were on outdoor relief, bringing a total of just under 20,000 people dependent entirely upon the poor law system. No wonder 16 ships left Galway for Boston and New York in that year, despite the knowledge of the hazards of an Atlantic crossing. There had been a number of ships that had gone down in the previous six months. Henry Comerford, was well aware of these conditions, not only from his position as a magistrate in both counties, but also because he leased his Bally Keel house property to accommodate 500 destitute women as, a, as an auxiliary poor house. And I, I won't go into some of the controversy surrounding this, but uh, he was making money on that too, as well as on his shipping interests. According to Griffith's valuation, Comerford also owned approximately 1,600 acres valued at uh, uh, just under 500 pounds sterling in the parish of Kilcoomen 
in the Okdorad area. Half of this acreage was in Lettermullen, where 52 tenants had holdings amounting to just 787 acres. The arable portions of these holdings uh, would have been uh, very, very uh, uh, small as the area is extremely rocky and, and craggy. Like many of his contemporaries, Comerford saw immigration as the only alternatives to starvation of the local cardias, as well as to the escalating poor law costs and taxation that landlords like himself faced. His enthusiasm for immigration was reflected in the following advertisement that he placed in the Galway Mercury to attract passengers for his ship, the Sarah Mildage, for a January 1847 voyage to Norfolk, Virginia. Quote, it is evident that the failure of the potato crop in Ireland will considerably increase the demand for labor in America, upon which the poor of Ireland has principally to rely for receiving a supply of food. The price of labor must consequently considerably increase during this next spring. It would therefore be most desirable for immigrants to secure without delay a passage by the above ship as they will arrive in that part of America possessing the most salubrious climate and well known to be the best grain and tobacco growing state. There can be no doubt whatever of obtaining immediate employment at high wages. The Galway Vindicator of March and April 1849 contains other Comerford advertisements for passenger bookings to New York on his ship, the Cremona, which was described as, quote, the largest vessel that ever sailed out of the port of Galway. A passenger list in the local museum in Letta Mullen indicates that the Brig St. John had one successful transatlantic journey uh, to Savannah, Georgia, before the ill-fated voyage to Boston in October 1849. And uh, recently, I discovered that it also had another voyage uh, to Boston in the spring of 1849 uh, in May, uh, in, in which 100 people uh, made the passage from the, the west of Ireland uh, over to Boston. I haven't been able to determine whether or not, as a landlord, Comerford uh, provided any assistance uh, to these tenants, uh, uh, some of whom may have been his own uh, lessees. Uh, but obviously, uh, some of the passengers would have uh, gained their passage uh, from remittances that relatives already here in uh, the Boston area would have sent them, or perhaps from the poor law uh, uh, people who uh, quite often did help to supplement the purchase of uh, tickets uh, across the ocean. In any event, since uh, North Clare and West Galway were areas still ravaged by hunger, disease, and sickness in 1849, it's not surprising that at least 100 men, women, and children fled their native uh, land on the Brig St. John in hopes of securing a better life in America. Uh, there is no official St. John passenger list extant, but contemporary newspaper reports include the names of 48 known passengers from Clare and 39 from Galway. The gender breakdown was 49 women, 30 men, and at least 25 children, possibly as many as 36 children. The crew numbered 15 and included two young apprentice boys. Newspaper reports indicate that at least 20 passengers had close relatives in Boston who had immigrated previously. Now the Brig St. John uh, left uh, uh, Galway City uh, on September 5th under the command of a Scotsman, uh, Captain Martin Oliver from uh, Bowamore County, Galway. The first mate was Henry Comerford, a nephew of the owner, and Isaac Comerford, another crew member, may have been as well. After departing Galway, the ship stopped in Letter Mullen overnight to take on more passengers and fresh water a delay that ultimately proved fateful. 
Since Comerford owned a store there and had rentals in the area, it's possible that some of the passengers who embarked at Letta Mullen were his tenants. After an uneventful voyage of 31 days, the St. John reached the tip of Cape Cod on Saturday, October 6th at about 5 p.m. The captain gathered the passengers on the deck that afternoon to announce that they would be uh, arriving in Boston the following day. As was uh, the custom at the time, he took a, uh, a roll call of the passengers to verify their names and their numbers uh, to submit to the authorities in Boston. As the captain's records were lost in the wreck, controversy continues to this day as to the exact number of people on the ship. Estimates range from 120, which was uh, 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 the uh, figure given by Captain Oliver, to as many as 165 given by surviving passengers. If it was over 120, this would have been a flagrant violation of the recently enacted navigation laws. After taking the passenger roll, uh, Captain Oliver distributed grog to the crew and told the passengers they could now celebrate their eagerly anticipated arrival in Boston the next day. Lanterns were strung up on the decks and there was much singing and dancing that evening. Little did these passengers know the terrible fate that awaited them. When rounding the tip of Cape Cod, the winds were south-southeast and thus the captain steered a 300 degree course which ordinarily would have taken the ship directly into the entrance of Boston Harbor. However, as evening wore on, the weather thickened and the seas got rough and the wind shifted around to the northeast and soon reached near hurricane force. At 1 a.m., when the ship was just off Situate Harbor Light, right out here, Captain Oliver tried to hold his vessel out into Massachusetts Bay away from the coast to avoid being blown onto the rocky reefs along the Situate Cohasset coast, an especially dangerous area where over the previous three decades, 20 ships, 26 ships had gone uh, down with a loss of 40 lives and $345,000 worth of cargo. Ironically, a lighthouse to warn mariners of this hazardous coastal stretch uh, was nearing completion on Minot's Ledge at the time of the St. John disaster. The St. John made little progress against the fierce northeast winds. And here you see some pictures of the storms around here. Many of you probably know quite well what they look like. That's in North Situate. And here's uh, Minot Ledge. Um, and here is a, a chart that I'll have reference to uh, in a minute. Uh, the, uh, when Captain Oliver's efforts uh, to wear the ship up, uh, well, let's see, what, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the Brig St. John made little progress against the fierce northeast winds and the raging sea, and by 6.30 a.m. it had been blown inside Minot's Ledge when the lookout discovered that another ship, the Brig uh, Kathleen, was further in near the mouth of Cohasset Harbor. And you can see that on, on, on the chart there. When uh, the captain tried to uh, wear his ship up to the Kathleen, this failed. He dropped two anchors just south of Minus Ledge, but they held only briefly, and that's when the ship was blown towards the Grampus Ledge, a spot so treacherous that it was described by one local as, quote, a shallow minefield of ledge, ledges which are submerged even at half tide. Captain Oliver ordered the crew to cut down the mass, and the anchors were dropped again, but to no avail. By 7 a.m., the St. John was foundering on the Grampus Ledge, and in less than an hour, it was completely broken apart as a result of the heavy surf, pounding it continually on the rocky ledge. Women and children below the decks probably died instantly. Meanwhile, after the captain and three crew members untangled the gear to launch the jolly boat at the stern uh, of the ship, 25 terrified passengers jumped into it 
and swamped it, with the result that these passengers and three crew members all perished. The captain and one uh, uh, passenger were hauled back on board after a line was thrown by the first mate uh, from the quarterdeck. Just as the crew was preparing to launch a large longboat, a very large wave, probably 20 to 30 feet high, hit the ship and swept many passengers as well as the longboat uh, uh, from the deck into the raging sea. Captain Oliver, first mate, uh, Henry Comerford and seven crew members and one passenger swam to the longboat, crawled aboard, and immediately headed towards shore. Uh, this, what they did was to uh, go. Uh, go where the blue where the blue arrow shows. Uh, uh, they, they went from the glamp. Uh, fr from the Grampus Ledge to the end of the glades where there was a hotel. Uh, and that's where, where uh, they, 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 they landed. They picked up one other passenger, a young stowaway, before reaching the glades, the nearest point uh, of shore. Passenger Patrick Sweeney, whose wife and nine children had already drowned, uh, uh, made a valiant but ultimate futile effort to swim to the longboat, uh, holding his three-year-old daughter, but they were drowned in a subsequent large wave. Among the Cohasset residents who watched uh, this unfolding tragedy from the top floor of her home at Sandy Cove was 26-year-old Elizabeth Lothrop. She recorded in her diary, quote, in about an hour after her masts were cut away, nothing was visible. In a moment, she had gone to atoms, and the sea had washed over the fragments, freighted with human beings. Soon, portions of the brig could be seen making for shore, now towering up uh, mountains high and then sinking into the depths of hell. Whether there were human beings on board for the thickness of the storm prevented me from determining that." Unquote. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's brothers raced down to the cove while her father, John J. Lothrop, raced to the local lifeboat station at Whitehead, where by 8 a.m. two lifeboats were launched to look for survivors. As a rescue team struggled to grow out to the Grampus Ledge, they encountered huge waves and fierce winds which obstructed any clear view of the site where the ship had foundered. When the larger rescue boat was about halfway there, they saw the St. John longboat headed towards the glades. Tragically, they assumed it contained all possible survivors, since no verbal or visual signal came from the St. John longboat that there might be more survivors at the wreck. The old women and children first rule evidently didn't apply to uh, the captain of the ship or his crew. The Cohasset uh, rescue boat then headed for the Kathleen, which although not in great danger was on the mudflats near the uh, harbor entrance. Captain Daniel T. Lothrop, Elizabeth's uncle and the head of the local life uh, boat unit, provided a written statement describing these rescue efforts. His report hinted that more passengers might have been saved had uh, they been given an appropriate signal from the St. John longboat that others might still be uh, in need of rescue. One of the rescue crew members was more emphatic and told Henry David Thoreau he was sure others might have been saved had they been directed to the wreckage site. Meanwhile, 13 St. John uh, passengers uh, began to uh, be washed ashore at Sandy Cove and Whitehead and Quarry Point. And this illustration is of Sandy Cove in Situate. And at these places, local residents braved the raging surf to pull victims ashore. One such resident was Charles A. Studley, who almost drowned in his efforts to uh, rescue uh, these people. As soon as Elizabeth Lothrop realized that there were survivors clinging to the wreckage, 
being washed ashore. She heated brooms, ransacked her house to secure blankets, hot drinks, and other provisions. These preparations paid off, and within a short time, she saw survivors being led towards her home by her brother. And she recalled, quote, See, I saw some miserable looking creatures that reminded me of drowned rats approaching. They could scarcely walk and were being led on either side of them. Our doors were open to receive them. Such a shuddering, shivering my ears never heard before. And such a set of half drowned, half naked, half frightened creatures my eyes never beheld. Three men were brought in and then a lot of women, all Irish. We placed them in bed and used every exertion to restore animation to two of the women whose moans could be heard throughout the house. These two were senseless from the wreck. It is likely that the two women Elizabeth was describing here were Mrs. Burke and Mrs. Cullen, who each lost three children in the tragedy. Another woman at the Lathrop house was uh, Mrs. Quinlan, who suffered severe head and internal injuries. Mrs. Burke's condition was especially serious as she was pregnant. She and Mrs. Quinlan stayed at the Lothrop house for a week. Other survivors were taken to the town center uh, where uh, they were placed in the home of Captain Abraham Tower, who lived just adjacent to the local physician, uh, Dr. Uh, Fordyce Foster, and if you go by Cohasset Common, you may recognize some of those structures. Uh, contemporary news reports praised Dr. Foster and the care that Cohasset residents provided, and it is significant that all who were rescued survived. Nobody died. Perhaps the most miraculous rescue came later that day when John Lothrop, Elizabeth's father, pulled an infant wrapped up in a blanket from a flotsam uh, of debris approaching the beach. The baby girl was in good condition and was taken in by the Gold family uh, down at the harbor. Uh, they lived there. After a few days, most of the surviving passengers were transferred to the town poorhouse. On October 21st, Elizabeth Lothrop wrote in her diary that she recently visited Mrs. Quinlan and Mrs. Burke at the poorhouse and was relieved to find them much improved. Yet having seen more dead bodies washed ashore on the beach that day, Elizabeth wrote, quote, I attended church today after a long absence, but my mind is so full of everything, I cannot pay much attention to the discourses. A dancing school has commenced but I do not attend it. My mind keeps running that way of this horrible shipwreck and the continuing picking up of dead bodies on our beach, which has so excited my mind that I can tell them I shall never get over it. The Massachusetts Humane Society awarded her one of their uh, medals uh, shortly after that for her work, but she refused to accept it and said, take it back and use you know, the money uh, for this, for uh, uh, survivors and people who need it. Now, after the St. John survivors were brought to safety, local Cohasset residents stayed on the shore and began the grim task of retrieving bodies that were washed up ashore. By 4 p.m. Monday, they discovered the bodies of 21 women, three men, and three children. By Tuesday morning, rough coffins had been prepared and numerous hay wagons gathered near the shore to transport them one mile inland for a funeral and burial that afternoon. It was at this point that uh, David Henry Thoreau, the famous essayist, uh, enters the St. John story. After seeing Boston newspaper headlines announcing the tragedy, Thoreau decided to go to Cohasset on the newly opened Boston Cohasset Railroad. He found carriages packed with distraught Irish people, anxious to know the fate of their friends and relatives who they had expected to welcome to Boston. In the shipwreck chapter of his book, Cape Cod, Thoreau provided a detailed, if rather clinical, account of the efforts made to identify the recovered bodies before their coffins were nail closed. 
One of the saddest episodes in this process happened when a South Boston woman, possibly Mrs. Adams, saw her sister, Peggy Mullen, and her own child in one of the coffins. The infant had been left behind in Ireland temporarily until her aunt could bring her over to her mother in Boston. The shocking loss of her infant and her sister was so great that the bereaved woman died three days later and was later uh, buried with them in the common grave. Around noon, uh, uh, on Tuesday, a long line of hay wagons carried the coffins one mile inland to the Unitarian First Parish Church on Cohasset Common, where the Reverend James Osgood and Reverend Reed conducted a funeral service. Osgood was the husband of Ellen Sewell, who had rejected Thoreau's marriage proposal nine years earlier. And some think that's why he went into the woods. <laughs> anyway, um, he, when he, he, he had seen the headlines about this in the Boston papers. He was on his way to the, to, to the Cape, and he and his friend Elry Chaney decided, well, let's go to Cohasset, because he knew about the town and see what's going on. Captain Oliver and the other surviving crew members attended and then marched in the procession to the burial in Cohasset Central Cemetery. Meanwhile, friends and relatives of the deceased, concerned that their loved ones were being buried without Catholic ritual, summoned the nearest Catholic priest at St. Mary's Church in Quincy, Reverend John Roden, and he arrived just in time to give a Catholic blessing uh, at the gravesite. The first 27 bodies recovered were buried in a common grave measuring about 20 by 9 feet. Since other bodies continued to wash ashore over the next few days, Eventually, 45 victims were buried there. As the grave was never marked or plotted on the cemetery records, its exact location remained uncertain until very recently, when it was determined to be on the south end of the cemetery adjacent to North Main Street. Father Roden returned to Cohasset three weeks later, and after hearing confessions on November 4th, he celebrated a heavily attended requiem mass for the victims in Cohasset Academy, which was located on the common and where the Cohasset Town Hall was later built. This was the first time a Catholic mass was set in Cohasset, and the event served as a catalyst to bring priests to private houses to say mass for the few Catholic families in the town, and eventually for the establishment of St. Anthony's Catholic parish in the town uh, in 1876. I'm a bit behind here on the illustrations, but here was Reverend Osgood's house. It still is the parish uh, house uh, in Cohasset for the Unitarian Church. Uh, and here we have um, the, uh, the crew saved and, and, and the crew lost, more saved than lost. Uh, and the list of passengers saved, all fairly young in their 20s. Um, and the list of local relatives uh, who uh, uh, were in Boston. And, and what this shows, of course, is the pattern of chain migration where uh, people would send for relatives uh, once they had gotten established. Um, and these were bodies identified before the burial. And here's uh, the, the St. Anthony's Church. It took uh, uh, quite, quite a bit of time, 70, uh, 20, 20, uh, 27 years before they collected enough money and did the work to open their parish. But that, that was the, uh, the uh, original St. Anthony's Church that, I don't know, most of you aren't old enough to remember that. <laughs> I, I do, <laughs> just before the, uh, the current structure uh, was, uh, was built. Um, nine women uh, and six male passengers, all in their 20s, survived the wreck, as, as the slide shows, as did a 14-year-old male stowaway and the infant girl. Evidence suggests that all but five of the surviving passengers Mary Kane, Austin Currens, Ellen Hassett, Betty Higgins, and a female infant returned to Ireland. 
However, Mary Kane, a young widow when she left County Clare in Ireland and who had been rescued by the local uh, Cohasset uh, mariner by the name of Michael Neptune Brennick, remained in Cohasset and married there twice. First to Charles Cole, an Englishman who ironically was drowned in uh, uh, a, a couple of, uh, 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 a decade later in 1862. The 1860 census indicates that Mary's two younger brothers, Thomas and Thomas Kane, came to Cohasset and lived with Mary and her husband Charles. After Charles's death, Mary eventually married an Irish-born Cohasset man, James St. John, who was a widower with four children. Ellen Hassett married a fellow survivor, Austin Kerens, and they settled in Vermont and raised a family of nine children. Betsy Higgins evidently stayed in Cohasset for a time as she uh, placed an ad in the Boston Pilot in search of her, her brother Miles and indicated that any information could be sent to her in Cohasset at the home of Alvin Whittington, who was later the inspector of fisheries in Cohasset, uh, and who also had a link with the uh, Humane Society. Uh, Betsy later married Michael Kelly, a laborer in Cohasset, and uh, the birth of their first child was recorded as uh, April 14, 1853 and registered in the town records there. The infant girl was later adopted by a Norwell family and according to local tradition, eventually married a prosperous Boston man of Irish extraction. Of the captain and the eight surviving crew, folk memory suggests that Isaac Comerford enlisted in the US Navy for a period before returning to Ireland. Crew member James Flaherty and his two brothers returned to Letamullen, and some of their descendants are found in that area today and are very conscious of this story. And one of them actually, when he got back, he built a cottage uh, for himself in Letamullen, which is now the main part of the, uh, the golf course there in Letamullen. Uh, and, and if you're a golfer, it's a tough course. Um, I, I tried it. I never lost as many golf balls in my, holes in my whole life. Uh, now, I have not been able to find out what happened to Captain Oliver. He just disappears from the record, as you can understand why he probably wanted to. Uh, nor have I been able to find out exactly how the return passages were funded probably from uh, money that people in the area gave to them. Now, will I go on and tell you about the commemorations? <laughs> you know, it's a beautiful day. I'm really glad you're here. So I'm going to over, overdo my, uh, uh, my time here. Uh, now, um, Professor Joe Lee and Kirby Miller, and more recently Mary Kelly, have stressed the long shadow of the famine across generations of Irish Americans and how it gained a greater consciousness and importance as an identity market in recent decades. Well, it is clear that personal memories of the shipwreck remained among St. Uh, Brig St. John survivors and their relatives, uh, uh, and the relatives of those lost. It was 60 years before the Irish American community in the Boston area took steps to honor the memory of the St. John victims. Given the multiple challenges of economic survival and the widespread nativist antipathy that Irish immigrants faced in the early post-famine decades, this delay is understandable. Scholars such as Paul Ricoeur and Pierre Nora, who study survivors of trauma in European history, the Holocaust especially, believe that in most cases, survivors do not take immediate steps to commemorate their lost relatives for some time. The pain is still too raw and inexpressible. Silence and repression are the easiest ways to cope with the pain. Historian Mary Kelly has uncovered considerable historical evidence suggesting that silence and repression was a coping mechanism for the majority of Irish Americans until the early 20th century. But eventually there arose a need to give meaning to that pain on both an individual and collective level. 
so that the experience was not lost to future generations. Commemorations are launched for these reasons, often creating a bond of common identity. Ricoeur contends that sometimes commemorations can be negative and paralyzing events which embitter and imprison people uh, in the trauma of the past if there is not a balance of remembering and forgetting. When done well, they can be positive, affirmative, and liberating processes when they acknowledge past pain within the context of a narrative of survival and a positive future. And certainly I think that is a process that uh, the AOH, John and, and his colleagues have been engaged in in a positive way over these last uh, 25 years or so. In, an in analyzing the AOH decision to erect a beautiful Celtic cross in 1914 and the ceremony itself, it's clear that the organizers and the planners were paying tribute to the lives of those lost as well as affirming the resilience of the survivors and giving a meaning to the broader Irish American community, uh, to the difficult common experience of immigration and resettlement. On a more pragmatic level, it's clear that by the first decade of the 20th century, children of famine immigrants in the Boston area were ready emotionally, materially, and politically to take up the important process of remembering and honoring the victims. The Yankee monopoly in Boston area politics, the law, and even business had been breached considerably. One only has to recall the names of Boston mayors, U. O'Brien, Patrick Collins, and John Honey Fitzgerald, and James Michael Curley to illustrate these political uh, advances. By 1900, Massachusetts had an increasingly Irish flavor from its 250,000 Irish-born population and the rejoining number of first and second generation uh, Irish Americans uh, uh, that, that were in Boston and other Massachusetts cities. The dramatic growth of the ancient order of Hibernians in Massachusetts, as the AOH uh, is widely known, in the last half of the 19th century, uh, it grew from one division of 200 members in Boston in 1859 to a peak of 171 divisions with uh, 27,000 members by 1908, just before this memorial project was undertaken. So this reflects an ethnic and religious consciousness that would not easily forget the famine era tragedies like the wreck of the Brig St. John. In fact, the National AOH contributed $50,000 to enable their Canadian brothers to erect a 45-foot Celtic cross on Gross Eel, uh, where approximately seven to 10,000 Irish uh, uh, famine uh, refugees died uh, 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 in, in, in the fever sheds uh, on, on that quarantine station. Uh, and it's possible that the example of the Canadian people in erecting that uh, helped to inspire uh, what uh, happened in, uh, in Cohasset. The uh, American national president of the AOH, Michael Cummings, who was from nearby Neponset, uh, attended the Gross Isle ceremony and gave a speech there. So it seems probable that there was a linkage uh, be be between the, uh, the two, uh, one inspiring the other. Two local Cohasset men, Joseph St. John, the stepson of Mary Payne, and Michael Sweeney, who headed the Cohasset local uh, AOH Division 16, uh, took up the project as there were at least 10 other AOH divisions within a 20-mile radius of Gohasset, there was a good base for launching a, subs a subscription campaign to pay for a memorial. Although the minutes of the National Executive Board of the AOH indicate they were informed of the project, they did not contribute any funds to this venture, and donors appear to have been exclusively from Massachusetts AOH divisions. By 1909, Cohasset's St. Anthony's Parish was 33 years old, and the largest portion of its parishioners were of Irish descent. So they may have supported this effort. The Cohasset Central Cemetery donated the land upon which the cross was erected, 
a donation that echoes the generosity that many in the Cohasset community extended in 1849. On Memorial Day, uh, May 30th, 1914, the beautifully uh, carved 20-foot granite uh, cross carved from westerly granite was dedicated on the highest point of Cohasset Central Cemetery. The cross was uh, uh, carved in the yard of Quincy Granite Dealer and County Kerry native, uh, Patrick J. Tagney. As I say, it was paid for by Massachusetts AOH divisions, both the men and the ladies. The dedication ceremony attracted over 10,000 people, about half of whom uh, were uh, AOH uh, members and uh, from the men's and ladies' divisions. The featured speaker was Massachusetts Governor David I. Walsh. The son of Irish immigrants and a member of the Clinton division of the AOH, uh, Walsh was the epitome of the Irish American success story. He went to Holy Cross College, he studied law and got a degree. Uh, he uh, went into politics and was the first Catholic elected uh, uh, to become uh, governor in 1914. He was also, I think, the first Catholic senator when he went on uh, uh, to the Senate. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, the podium uh, here on the day of the dedication. Walsh is there in the center. Michael Cummings is there. Uh, and uh, the woman who headed, headed up, you can see her over on the right-hand side in the back. Uh, she was president of the Ladies AOH of America. And uh, Mr. St. John is uh, further over to the, to the right. Uh, and here we see how the dignitaries got to the cemetery, uh, classic old car there. And uh, in the back seat, is uh, Joseph St. John with the big tall hat and uh, his uh, uh, a young girl and also his daughter who actually did the, the unveiling. And there, there they are uh, just after the, the, the cross was unveiled. Um, Military units of the AOH fired a gun salute to Governor Walsh uh, uh, at, at the conclusion of the two-mile march uh, from the town center uh, to the cemetery. Uh, and and the, the procession was led by the Cohasset police uh, as well as state officers of the AOH. And there were four automobiles like the one I showed in the parade. It it's, uh, seems that there were 7,000 people who actually uh, were in the parade, and the total attendance was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 12,000. Mary Kane was still alive in 1914, but at 89 was unable to attend. Unlike the Gaelic inscription at the Gross Isle uh, uh, memorial. The inscription at Cohasset had no overt anti-British political message. It was just a simple recognition of the human tragedy of the lives lost in 1849. The decorative motif on the cross replicated the interlacing and symbols of the harp and the shamrock that had gained such popularity in Ireland during the Gaelic nationalist revival of, of the two previous decades. As he was well versed in Irish history, Governor Walsh's oration recounted the struggles of uh, the Irish people uh, over, the, uh, over the centuries. Uh, and the tragic irony of the victims losing their lives while they were in sight of America. He quoted the first verse of Arthur William O'Shaughnessy's renowned we are the music makers to emphasize that despite this great tragedy and so many others in the Irish historical experience, the Irish were still dreamers of dreams and the movers and shakers of the world forever." Unquote. He celebrated the political and economic and social progress that immigrants had made and that 
their children achieved and pointed with pride to the successful passage of the, uh, the, uh, that week of the third uh, reading of the Home Rule Bill. Walsh forecast a future of peace and prosperity for his ancestral land, obviously unaware that the Ulster problem and the First World War would soon dash these optimistic predictions about the coming of home rule. Yet the occasion in Wall's speech symbolized that the Massachusetts Irish were no longer victims or impoverished refugees, but increasingly agents of their own destiny and important players in the political, economic, and social life of the region. The timing of the event on Memorial Day weekend rather than on the actual anniversary of the tragedy suggests a desire to emphasize that there was compatibility between the organizers and participants' pride in their Irish heritage and their status as fully engaged American citizens. Now, um, it seems that there were no commemorations that took place after uh, 1914 uh, that I've been able to find until 1949, the 100th anniversary in which there uh, was another uh, large-scale commemoration organized. Um, by this juncture, the Cohasset AOH division was defunct, and the statewide ranks of the AOH had declined by two-thirds to only 83,000 members. Nonetheless, Charles J. O'Malley, a Boston journalist and a native of County Mayo, took the lead in organizing the centenary event. He lived on the Cohasset shoreline where eight bodies of the uh, St. John victims were recovered and he was determined to raise awareness of the approaching centenary. 1949 also marked the 100th anniversary of the first Catholic Mass in Cohasset, and the Boston Archdiocese therefore became involved. As a son of Irish immigrants, and having had his first priestly assignment uh, at Cohasset St. Anthony's Parish in 1921, Archbishop Richard J. Cushing enthusiastically joined the local Cohasset Committee and the state offices of the AOH in planning the ceremony. On 21 August 1949, Archbishop Cushing celebrated a solemn pontifical mass on a large covered stage erected on the grounds of St. Anthony's Parish before a congregation of about 2,000 people. The Archbishop was assisted by 29 priests whose names indicated Irish ancestry and a mixed choir of 36 voices from neighboring uh, 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 situate parish of St. Mary's. Uh, following the Mass, um, uh, AOH offices laid a wreath on uh, the Celtic cross Mr. O'Malley and his committee of 37 uh, local Cohasset men delivered on their promise to have many distinguished orators and guests on this occasion. The most prominent of these was the United States Secretary for Labor, Morris J. Tobin, who was the son of Irish immigrants and had previously served two terms as Boston mayor and one as governor of the Commonwealth. Other prominent politicians attending were Governor Paul A. Dever, Mayor of Boston James Michael Curley, as well as a number of uh, local political representatives. The Republic of Ireland uh, Consul General also attended, as did representatives of the Charitable Irish Society, including their president, F. Murray Forbes, whose ancestor, Captain Robert Bennett Forbes, had brought vital food and supplies to Boston from Boston to Cork on the USS Jamestown in the spring of 1847. As in 1914, the elaborate ceremony commemoration symbolized the success and strength of the Irish community in the Boston area, as well as uh, the success of the Catholic Church in establishing a strong profile in a traditionally Yankee Protestant uh, community. This was the town, after all, that rejected Joseph Kennedy's application for the Coas Golf Club uh, <laughs> uh, to join, and that's, that's how they ended up in, um, in Hyannisport. Uh, uh, 
Archbishop Cushing visited Galway only a few weeks after this centenary event, and in his speech at the Maxima Aula at the University College campus, he acknowledged the deep significance that the St. John tragedy had for people in the Galway area, as well as the great contribution of Irish immigrants, and especially Irish women immigrants, uh, contributions they had made to America, the Catholic Church, and society. And people in uh, Galway uh, also began to uh, recognize this tragedy and uh, constructed memorials. This is one that is at Letter Mullen, uh, a plain but nonetheless uh, uh, inspiring memorial near the churchyards there, in the churchyard there. And there is also a stained glass window uh, in, in that church. Now, although commemorations of the St. John tragedy were infrequent after this. As John mentioned in 1992, uh, the practice was uh, arrived again, uh, so, uh, revived again, and Jack Meehan was the leading voice in getting that to happen. Uh, and for the 150th uh, commemoration, uh, the major uh, and important feature of that was that people from uh, Connemara, from Letamala area, came over and participated in that commemoration. And the Cohasset Historical uh, uh, Commission worked very, very diligently uh, with people to make sure that that was a uh, very fine commemoration. Uh, among some of the uh, major events associated with that was the, uh, uh, a small group of people from Galway and the local people uh, went out in a boat to the Grampus Ledge and uh, dropped a hundred uh, roses uh, on the site of, of the wreck. Uh, and uh, I urge you, when it reopens, uh, it's under reconstruction right now, you should go to the Cohasset Maritime Museum where you can see some artifacts that were recovered at the, at the, at the time of, of the tragedy. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly when that's scheduled to be uh, to be uh, uh, reopened. Uh, th th this uh, commemoration in 1999 had a greater involvement of the wider Cohasset community, and that signified a kind of common recognition by both of these, those of Irish and Yankee descent, uh, of this terrible tragedy and the trauma of the famine er era. Uh, Cohasset, as you know, is no longer a, an exclusively Yankee Protestant town, and it is the home of many successful Irish American bankers, lawyers, and business people, and women who were whose grandparents uh, uh, and maybe even parents uh, were born in Ireland. And the Plymouth Division, of course, has been very important in highlighting uh, uh, these commemorations. Meanwhile, in 2012, oh, well, I should have plugged in the other thing. Uh, there was only one more slide left. But in 2012, uh, Boston was the site of the international commemoration, <coughs> annual commemoration sponsored by the Irish government. And there was uh, uh, a, a very, very large event in uh, Faneuil Hall uh, that, that was addressed by Irish President Michael D. Higgins. And uh, it was arranged that uh, uh, the, the St. John descendants uh, be part of that uh, program. And Paul St. John, who has since uh, deceased, and his son Martin uh, were called on stage and presented with a certificate of Irish heritage by uh, by President uh, by President uh, Higgins, and uh, they they were both delighted that uh, their family story had been remembered. Now um, uh, I'll, I'll put in another plug. Uh, I hope you will all be able to come in next Sunday. Come next Sunday for the uh, program at uh, at uh, St. Anthony's Church, and I and I know John Colvin will give a very very fine. Uh, account of um, the famine uh, times from his perspective as, as a city archivist. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll answer any questions if you have any, uh, and thank you for 
of taking time.